It seems that we're live. <gasps> oh my gosh. We're here. Hello, everybody. Yes, the stream will start, has started. And this time it's a little bit different because uh, I'm not receiving any support from uh, from Jay because he's not here tonight. So I'm doing this all by myself. Uh, I've uh, got OBS set up also very much thanks to Jay. And I've got all the controls right here, but that doesn't mean I know how to use them. So uh, we're going to try and uh, make this uh, as awesome as we can. And this is, uh, this is really weird to be the only one streaming for the first time. But it's good to see you all. And I hope you guys will, uh, will talk a lot in chat. So that will definitely help. It's good to see you all. I see uh, Furry, the doctor. Uh, I see Ferros and Zier. I see Bramsteinfos. So good. And uh, Phoenicia, good evening everybody and welcome to a new story stream. And tonight we're probably, probably going to finish the Peter Rabbit books. Yes, maybe Elsa will pop up in the chat, but we will never know. She's unpredictable like that, so uh, uh, we'll see. And Phoenicia is making a mouse plushie at the moment. A Mickey Mouse or uh, another plushie? And do you guys hear the music? You know, I'm playing this, uh, the, the Spotify playlist. But I don't hear it through my headset. I'm hearing it from my speaker. So I don't know if, if something is going wrong here. In the far distance. Yeah, that's kind of what I was afraid of. So, hmm. Don't know if I can change that. But you hear my voice all right. Right? Or has that, is that also different? No music. All right. Let's see if... Five. If I have... Some music... Yeah. Hmm. No, I really have no idea how to change this. So. Maybe I'll learn. Then in the future it'll be better. So we'll just take this as a starting point. And decide that it can only go up from, from here, right? Uh, so indeed, you have a really soft uh, music uh, tonight. And then uh, next time, we'll get louder. Um, let's see, which was the last? I think it was the pie and the patty pan. So the next one would be ginger and pickles. I wonder what that's all about. Except... Of course, ginger and pickles. Oh, Phoenicia says the mouse will be a prop for an outfit. Oh, that's really nice. That's, I bet it's going to be looking really cool. I used to uh, fold mice from uh, handkerchiefs. And uh, until my teachers uh, started to think that was just so cool, then I thought it wasn't cool anymore. 
then I stopped. That's the trick of dealing with uh, kids in puberty. Just if they have behavior that you don't like, just say, oh, that's so cool. And they're like, no, no. Phil <laughs> says, a meow fit. <laughs> Could be if you're a cat that eats a mouse, then uh, yeah, you might be wearing a meow fit. All right, I'm going to read right now the tale of Ginger and Pickles. With very kind regards to old Mr. John Taylor, who thinks he might pass as a dormouse. Three years in bed and never a grumble. <laughs> Aww. Once upon a time, there was a village, village shop. The name over the window was Ginger and Pickles. It was a little small shop, just the right size for dolls. Lucinda and Jane Doll, cook always, doll cook, always bought their groceries at Ginger and Pickles. The counter inside was a convenient height for rabbits. Ginger and Pickles sold red spotty pocket handkerchiefs at a penny three farthings. They also sold sugar and snuff and galoshes. In fact, although it was such a small shop, it sold nearly everything, except a few things that you might want in a hurry, like bootlaces and hairpins and mutton chops. Ginger and Pickles were the people who kept the shop. Ginger was a yellow tomcat and Pickles was a terrier. The rabbits were always a little bit afraid of Pickles. Understandably. The shop was also patronized by mice. Only the mice were rather afraid of Ginger. Ginger usually requested Pickles to serve them because he said it made his mouth water. I cannot bear, said he, to see them going out that door, carrying their little parcels. I have the same feeling about rats, replied Pickles, but I would never uh, do to eat our own customers. They would leave us and go to Tabita Twitches. On the contrary, they would go nowhere replied Ginger gloomily. Tabitha Twitchit kept the only other shop in the village. She did not give credit. Ginger and Pickles gave unlimited credit. Now the meaning of credit is, th is this. When a customer buys a bar of soap, instead of the customer pulling out a purse and paying for it, she says she will pay another time. And Pickles makes a low bow and says, With pleasure, ma'am. And it's written down in a book. The customers come again and again and buy quantities, in spite of being afraid of Ginger and Pickles. But there's no money in what is called the till. The customers came in crowds every day and bought quantities, especially the toffee customers. But there was always no money. They never paid for as much as a pennyworth of peppermints. But the sales were enormous, ten times as large as the Bita Twitchets. As there was always no money, Ginger and Pickles were obligated to eat their own goods. Pickles ate biscuits and Ginger ate dried hard dog. 
They ate them by candlelight after the shop was closed. When it came to January 1st, there was still no money. And Pickles was unable to buy a dog license. It is very unpleasant. I am afraid of the police, said Pickles. It is your own fault for being a terrier. I do not require a license. And neither does Cap, the collie dog. It is very uncomfortable. I am afraid I shall be summoned. I have tried in vain to get a license upon credit at the post office, said Pickles. The place is full of policemen. I met one as I was coming home. Let us send in the bill again to Samuel Whiskers. He owes twenty-two-nine for bacon. I do not believe he intends to pay at all, replied Ginger. And I feel sure that ten Anna Maria pocket things. Where? are all the cream crackers. You have eaten them yourself, replied Ginger. Ginger and Pickles retired into the back parlor. They did accounts. They added up sums and sums and sums. Samuel Whiskers has run up a bill as long as his tail. And he has had an ounce and three quarters of snuff since October. What is seven pounds of butter at one three? And a stick of sealing wax and four matches? Sends in all the bi bills again to everybody with... Compts... I don't know, compliments? <laughs> Composition. I don't know. After a time, they heard a noise in the shop, as if something has been pushed in at the door. They came out of the back parlor. There was an envelope lying on the counter, and a policeman writing in a notebook. Pickles nearly had a fit. He barked and he barked and made little rushes. Bite him, Pickles! Bite him! spluttered Ginger behind the sugar barrel. He's only a German doll! The policeman went on writing in his notebook. Twice he put his pencil in his mouth. And once he dipped it in the trickle. Pickles barked until he was hoarse. But still, the policeman took no notice. He had bead eyes, and his helmet was sewed on with stitches. At length, on his, little, on his last little rush, Pickles found that the shop was empty. The policeman had disappeared. But the envelope remained. Do you think that he has gone to fetch a real-life policeman? I am afraid it is a summons, said Pickles. No, replied Ginger, who had opened the envelope. It is the rates and taxes. Three pounds, nineteen cents and a lot. This is the last straw, said Pickles. Let us close the shop. They put up the shutters and left, but they have not removed from the neighborhood. In fact, some people wish they had gone further. Ginger is living in the Warren. I do not know what occupation he pursues. He looks stout and comfortable. 
Pickles is at present a gamekeeper. The closing of the shop caused great inconvenience. Tabitha, Tabitha Twitchit immediately raised the price of everything a half penny, and she continued to refuse to give credit. Of course, there are the tradesmen's cards, the butcher, the fishman, and Timothy Baker. But a person cannot live on seed wigs and sponge cake and butter buns, not even when the sponge cake is as good as, as Timothy's. After a time, Mr. John Dormouse and his daughter began to sell peppermints and candles. But they did not keep self-fitting sixes, and it takes five mice to carry one, one seven-inch candle. Besides, the candles which they sell behave very strangely in warm weather. And Miss Dormouse refused to take back the ends when they were brought back to her with complaints. And when Mr. John Dormouse was, was complained to, he stayed in bed and would say nothing but very snug, which is not the way to carry on a retail business. So everybody was pleased when Sally Henny Penny sent out a printed poster to say that she was going to reopen the shop. Henny's opening sale, grand cooperative jumble, pennies, penny prices, come buy, come try, come buy. The poster really was most enticing. There was a rush upon the opening day. The shop was crammed with customers and there were crowds of mice upon the biscuit canisters. Sale Henny Penny gets rather flustered when she tries to count out the change and she insists on being paid cash, but she is quite harmless. And she has laid in a remarkable assortment of bargains. There is something to please everybody. And somehow this is the end. All right, so they give up and the chicken takes over. <laughs> that's, that's the moral of this story. Chickens are evil? No, they are not. Uh, the chickens save the day. What would you say is the moral of this story? Did you also think this uh, ending was a bit sudden? Hmm. Let's see. When the cat and dogs go away, the chickens will play. Ooh. Yeah. Like a poultry lesson to learn. Yeah. It's not easy. Oh. That story was unavailable. But we do... Wasn't this... We've already had this story. Wait, I'm going... Up. The story of Miss Moppet.
foul play. <laughs> yeah. They were bad business animals. Letting customers buy on credit. Yeah. Yeah. They paid for everyone's goods. Too bad. They meant so well. Well, let's see if um, Miss Moppet has better luck. Like the story of Miss Moppet. This is a pussy called Miss Moppet. She thinks she has heard a mouse. This is the mouse peeping out behind the cupboard and making fun of Miss Moppet. He is not afraid of a kitten. This is Miss Moppet jumping just too late. She misses the mouse and hits her own head. She thinks it is a very hard cupboard. The mouse watches Miss Moppet from the top of the cupboard. Miss Moppet ties up her head in a duster and sits before the fire. Yeah, she has quite a headache, probably. The mouse thinks she is looking very ill. He comes sliding down the bell pole. There she is. Miss Moppet looks worse and worse. The mouse comes a little nearer. But look at that. Miss Moppet holds her poor head in her paws and looks at him through a hole in the duster. The mouse comes very close. And then all of a sudden, Miss Moppet jumps upon the mouse. She's got him. And because the mouse has teased Miss Moppet, Miss Moppet thinks she will tease the mouse, which is not at all nice of Miss Moppet. She lets him up in the duster and tosses him around like a ball. But she forgot about that hole in the duster and when she untied it there was no mouse he has wriggled out and run away and he is dancing a jig on top of the cupboard short but sweet Origin of Tom and Jerry. Yeah, I don't know how much older it is. Maybe Moppet is the mother of Tom. That would be fun, right? Alright, we only have three more stories to go. These are only rhymes, so I definitely think we will <laughs> end the book tonight. All right, Apple Dapley's nursery rhymes. Apple Dapley, a little brown mouse, goes to the cupboard in somebody's house. In somebody's cupboard, there's everything nice. Cake, cheese, jam, biscuits, 
all charming for mice. Apply Deply has little sharp eyes, and Apply Deply is so fond of pies. Now who is this knocking at Cottontail's door? Tip tap it, tip tap it, she heard it before. And when she peeps out, there is nobody there, but a present of carrots put down on the stair. Hark! I hear it again. Tap, tap, tap it, tap, tap it. Why? I really believe it's a black rabbit. Old Mr. Pricklepin has never a cushion to stick his pins in. His nose is black and his beard is gray, and he lives, lives in an ash dump over the way. You know the old woman who lived in a shoe and had so many children she didn't know what to do. I think she lived in a little ho shoe house. That little old woman was surely a mouse. Diggory Diggory Delvet, a little old man in black velvet. He digs and he delves. You can see it for yourselves. He mounts dugs by Div Diggory Delvet. Gravy and potatoes in a good brown pot. Put them in the oven and serve them very hot. There once was a guinea pig who brushed back his hair like periwig. He wore a sweet tie as blue as the sky and his whiskers and buttons were very big. The end. Yeah. I think it's really fun how these stories ha almost have more pictures than text and all hand painted. It's also just so magical and pretty. They're not being uh, shy with the drawings. <laughs> and after... Well, that was Apply Dapply. We have one more nursery rhymes. Yeah, it's it's a really beautiful world. Sometimes it makes no sense. Like some of the stories are for really young kids and others are for a bit older kids. And sometimes they just stop in the middle of something. But all of it uh yeah, it, it's all part of the um, of the charm. So strange, right? How what worked back then and perhaps wouldn't always work today. Every era has their own stories. And the wisdom also, listen kids. Don't give credit. <laughs> yeah, that's a harsh lesson. Yeah. But you can uh, have a, a penny sale. Just no credit. Let's see. There's a little Peter in New Zealand. Maybe a rabbit, maybe not. Cecily Parsley's Nursery Rhymes. Cecily Parsley lived in a pen and brewed good.
good ale for gentlemen. Gentlemen came every day, till Cecily partly ran away. Goosey, goosey gander, whither will you wander? Upstairs and downstairs, and in my lady's chamber? This pig went to market, this pig stayed at home. This pig had a bit of meat, and this pig had none. This little pig cried, wee, 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 I can't find my way home. Pussycat sits by the fire. How should she be fair? In walks the little dog says, Pussy, are you there? How do you do, Mr. Pussy? Mrs. Pussy, how do you do? I thank you kindly, little dog. I fare as well as you. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. They all run at the farmer's wife and she cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a thing in your life as three blind mice? Weird. Bow wow wow, whose dog art thou? I'm little Tom Tinker's dog. Bow wow wow. This is great poetry. We have a little garden, a garden of our own. And every day we water there the seeds that we have grown. We love our little garden. And tend it with such care, you will not find a faded leaf or blighted blossom there. Ninny nanny netty coat, in a white petticoat, with a red nose, the longer she stands, the shorter she grows. Ah, a candle is a ninny nanny netty coat. So how many ninny nanny netty coats are you going to burn for this Christmas? Well, <laughs> Phil says, I think Snoop Dogg read this book and made it uh, bow wow yip yo yip yeah. When you think about it, Pickles became a game warden and it looked like Ginger became a poacher. That might hint at a dark ending. Yeah, maybe they eventually did eat their customers. But not while they ran their shop. Yeah, just like what, what turned them into serial killers? And the people never knew because they ran away with the chicken. Oof. All right, so this one is also not available. That means we're done, people. We have finished this book. Three blind mice is using Atomic from Blondie. Mm. Alright, Gary says, dead. That turned them into 
serial killers. Well, I hope none of you are uh, are in debt. And uh, if you are, let's. I hope you remember we're friends. So yeah, I. Uh, I wonder if that is indeed how she meant it. And that she indeed put that dark edge there purposely. Fel says, nice stories. Thanks for reading. Well, it was a lot of fun reading this for you. Is there... Let's see. Do you know if she has uh, more books? Because we still have... We're only halfway. We still have half a stream to go. Let's see. And I know you're going to see a different screen now. So here's Helen Beatrix Potter. You know, every time that I tell someone that I read the Beatrix Potter stories at the stream, they're like, Oh, from Harry Potter? Like, no. The Tale of Kitty in Boots in 2016? That's not possible. How? How old is this woman? Alright, shall we go read this one? Even though it has no pictures? Because it's not free. Too bad. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I do wonder, does it say everything? Does it say anything? The author died in 1943. So works by this author are also in the public domain in countries and areas. Yeah. Uh, but of course the drawings are not. Alright, and because some of this story is copyrighted in the United States still. So that's why the tale of Little Pig Robinson apparently is not available. But yes, let's uh, talk about, or let's read the tale of Kitty in Boots. The newest story. Once upon a time, there was a serious well-behaved young black cat. It belonged to a kind old lady who assured me that no other cat could compare with Kitty. She lived in constant fear that Kitty might be stolen. I hear there is a shocking fashion for black cat skin muffs. Wherever is Kitty gone to? Kitty! Kitty! She called it Kitty, but Kitty called herself Miss Catherine St. Quentin. Cheesebox called her Q, and Winky Peeps called her Squinterns, Squintums. They were very common cats. The old lady would have been shocked had she known of the acquaintance and she would have been painfully surprised had she ever seen Miss Kitty in a gentleman's Norfolk jacket and little fur-lined boots. Now, 
Most cats love the moonlight and staying out at nights. But it was curious how willingly Miss Kitty went to bed. And although the wash house where she slept locked in was always very clean, upon some mornings Kitty was left out with a black chin, and on other mornings her tail seemed thicker and she scratched. It puzzled me. It was a long time before I guessed that there were in fact two black cats. If we had been outside the wash house one summer night by moonlight, we might have seen one black cat cross the yard and jump upon the window sill. You are late, winky peeps, said another black cat inside. Sorry, squintums, answered the first black cat, unfastening the outside shutter. I object to being called names, said Miss Catherine, jumping gracefully out of the window. For this was Naughty Kitty's plan. When she wanted to go a hunting, Winky Peeps, Winkle Peep, Winky Peeps opened the window and came in to wait till Kitty came home. Tonight, he stopped outside. Kitty had put her coat and her little boots. Get in through the window, Winky Peeps. Shant, said Winky Peeps def defiantly. What? said Miss Catherine preparing to scratch him. Winky Peeps changed his tone and began to purr and coax. Please, Miss Kitty, let me go a hunting too. Slimy Jimmy is doing rabbit holes with his cousin John Stoat Ferret. Where? Where? asked Kitty. Her cat's eyes flashed. She had once seen a rabbit in the garden. In the wood behind Cheese Box House. They want to borrow your air gun, Miss Quintums, purred Winkle Peeps. Cheese Box wouldn't give it to them. Certainly not, said Miss Catherine. Nevertheless, she and Winky Peeps hurried away up the lane towards Cheese Box's house. Cheese Box was a stout tortoise shell cat who lived at the edge of the wood. I do not think Cheesebox herself ever went rabbiting. She had more sense, while there were rats and mice in plenty. But she collected odds and ends for Mr. Worry Regman, and knowing a little terrier who drove about the country in a little rattling cart. He bought rabbit skins and mole skins, rags and bones, and, oh, shocking, feathers and eggs from Cheesebox, and from Winky Peeps, and from Tommy Brock the Badger, and Mr. Todd the Fox. There's your gun, Miss Q. How good it may do you. I don't hold with poaching along. Uh, with dirty ferrets, mind that. At this moment, the gun, which Miss Kitty was loading, went off. Winky Peeps fled from the house with a squeal, and Cheesebox scuffed Kitty. When Kitty came out, Winky Peeps was nowhere to be seen. I think Cheesebox may be right about ferrets. Miss Kitty shot the gun with a snap, and it went off again. The gun was an air gun, so Miss Kitty ran no risk with gunpowder. I will mouse, said she, snapping it shut. 
it went off sideways. Was that meant for me? If you please, sir, it's gone through the washing. Miss Kitty was rather flattered to be mistaken for a sportsman. I think we are missing some text here. She apologized to the person who came out with the bundle, curtsied, and trotted down the field. I wonder what sort of things it would be proper to shoot. Certainly not washerwomen who are hedgehogs, said Miss Kitty, watching Mr. Tiggy, Tiggy Wrinkle. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. No. I suppose I must mouse. Miss Kitty stalked behind trees. She saw a mouse, took a long aim and pulled the trigger. But the air gun was not loaded at all. And the mouse jumped away from Miss Kitty. Another mouse she missed, another she durst not fire at because it was carrying a basket, and twice she shot at sticks and stones that were not mice at all. Except for the pride of carrying a gun, it was only poor sport. Perhaps I could shoot birds. Are those crows? She came through a gate into a field and found both crows and a flock of mountain sheep. Mutton? said Kitty doubtfully, presenting her gun. The sheep stamped their feet and began to walk up the old little cat, the odd little cat, while the crows swooped over her head. Miss Kitty took to our heels. I cannot waste pellets on rocketing birds. She hid at the back of a wall. Presently there was a scuffling noise of falling stones. Kitty was all attention. The noise moved further on. Something poked out of a hole and whisked in in again. After several false starts, Kitty's air gun went off and there was a squeak. She ran forward and met not a mouse, but a large white ferret rubbing its head and another brown ferret in gaiters dropped off the top of a wall and wrenched the precious air gun out of Miss Kitty's hands, exclaiming, give us that th their gun. You ain't fit to carry a gun. What do you mean by shooting my cousin, Slimy Jimmy? Give us your pellets this minute! Miss Kitty replied with a very painful scratch abo across both their faces. She also spat at them. I once saw a co copybook heading to the effect that evil communications corrupt good manners. Miss Catherine's manners were not improved by associating with poaching ferrets. And at home, that kind old lady was giving Wrin Wrinkle Peeps breakfast and wondering why dear Kitty's chin was black. Up in the wood, the real Kitty, sulky and spitting, followed the ferrets. She would not give them the pellets and they would not give up the gun. We will not go into details. They took it in turn to go on the ground, and I believe they did beg a few young rabbits, but at last they met their match. Slimy Jimmy suddenly came out of a burrow, pursued by, stout, by a stout buck rabbit in a blue coat who was prodding him violently and painfully with an umbrella. They upset John Stoat Ferret, who was waiting outside with the net, and before he could pick himself up, Miss Kitty had seized the gun. 
The rabbit, after several violent pokes, went off, walking fast and brandishing the umbrella. The ferrets followed him. Miss Catherine also followed, at a distance. The rabbit made no attempt to get, a, to get right away. From time to time he stopped and waved the umbrella defiantly. They saw him go over a mossy tumble-down wall and disappear. John Stoat Ferret and his cousin Slime, Slimmy, being short-legged and in gaiters, went through a conveniently arranged tunnel under a wall. But they did not come out the other side. They had walked into one of Mr. Todd's tri traps. You know, the fox who lives in the woods. There we will leave them, as the rabbit did, and he had come near enough to make sure that they were fast. Miss Catherine, rather out of breath, eyed the rabbit. He was very fat. He winked at Miss Catherine, pointed at the ferrets, made a bow, and turned to go home. Now why could not Kitty have the sense to go home too? It is true that Winky Peeps would have been there, so there would have been two black cats, but she might have stayed quietly at cheese boxes until dark. No, I fear Miss Catherine was a born poacher. Nothing would serve her, but she must follow that rabbit. She did not like to shoot because he was wearing such an elegant jacket. Alright. I'm hearing noises through my headphones, sorry. Can you guys still hear me? My microphone seems to be okay. So, I'll, I'll continue. Ah, I see. You hear me. Great. The rabbit at first took no notice. Then he became uneasy and hid behind trees. Miss Kitty could see the tips of his ears whenever he stopped. She lifted her gun. The rabbit opened his umbrella and set off again. It bobbited along under the bushes like a live mushroom. Miss Kitty followed and followed. The rabbit led her around and round, till at length they came back to another part of the same wall. He shut his umbrella, waved it defiantly, took a long jump off the top of the wall and disappeared. Miss Kitty avoiding all risks of drains and tunnels, took a long jump too, but not quite so long a jump as the rabbits. She came down, flop, in another of Mr. Todd's traps, caught by both toes across her lovely fur-lined boots. She gave a loud caterwaul and then sat still. Miss Kitty sat on the trap, she sat, and she sat. She ate one mouse, raw, which was all the game in her bag. Her toes were not really hurt, but so very, very fast, her feet went to sleep, and she had pins and needles. She sat there all night, her, greens cat, her green cat's eyes peered into the dark. Once there was a noise like a cat in the distance. Could it be Winky Peeps? Kitty mewed, but there was no answer. It was very sad, but Miss Kitty ought not to have gone out on the sky, on the sly, poaching. It served her right. It seemed plain that she would have to remain in the trap till the person who had said it let her out. And when he arrived, it was Mr. Todd, the fox. 
Oh, said Mr. Todd, getting over the wall and throwing down a rather bulging bag. Oh, is this the rest of the black cat skin muff? Miss Kitty shivered. It seems to match, said Mr. Todd, opening the bag. It contained mole and furs of various sorts, and he drew out half of a fine thick black cat's tail. A complete set of furs, said Mr. Todd, edging up towards Miss Kitty, who immediately pointed the gun at him. Gently, gently, madam, cried Mr. Todd, skipping over the wall. I was only going to release you from your uncomfortable position. Allow me to push forward the catch of the... Oh, oh, that went through my coat sleeve. Mr. Todd's nerves were thoroughly upset. Madam, I beg you to put down that most unsafe firearm. Allow me to unfasten the trap and pick up my bag. The bag, thought Miss Kitty. He dare not come for it. I have only five pellets left, but he does, but he does not know that. Mr. Todd and Miss Kitty argued all day. In the evening, Mr. Todd went off. Perhaps you may have come to your senses before morning, madam. Kitty sat con disconsolate, disconsolately in the trap and eyed the bag. The bag wobbled, turned over and rolled within reach of Kitty. Winky peeps, inquired Kitty in a hor horrified whisper. Oh, sir, if you please, it's only me. Oh, please, let me out. I'm nearly smothered. Kitty unstrapped the bag, which contained five moleskins, a brown and white fur of good quality, but unpleasant smell, half a cat's tail, two young rabbits, partly eaten, and a hedgehog. Oh, sir, I'm that grateful. Madam, Miss Catherine St. Quentin, you do my washing. Why, mm, Miss Quintums, is it you? Whatever is the matter? I'm fast by my feet, and I'm awfully hungry. Mrs. Stiggywinkle jerked up her prickles. You wouldn't go eat me, hmm? Not to mention the washing. Indeed, I wouldn't and couldn't, Mr. Tiggywinkle. Do pray help me to get loose. A knave he is. Mm. That Todd. Now let me put a little stone in the hinge of the trap and we'll try to unlace your boots. It was a painful struggle. But at length, Miss Kitty, with the loss of one toe, wriggled out, leaving her boots in the trap. It was less it was of less consequence, as she immediately threw away her coat and gun. Never again will I poach, said Miss Kitty. She limped home and into the do drawing room. There upon the hearth rug sat Win Winkle Peeps, wrapped in a shawl with sticking plaster on his tail. Kitty chose to look upon Wrinkle Peeps as the house of her misfortunes, as the cause of her misfortunes. She rushed upon him and they fought over, all over the drawing room. For the rest of her days, Kitty was a little lame, but it was an elegant limp and she found quite enough occupation about the yard catching mice and rats, varied by tea parties with respectable cats in the village, such as Ribby and Tabitha Twitchit. But Ring Winky Peeps lived in the woods. 
Slimmy Jimmy suddenly came out of a burrow, pers pursued by a stout buck rabbit in a blue coat, who was prodding him violently and painfully with an umbrella. Yeah, that was from earlier. Alright. A story about two cats who looked very much alike. Yeah, I think this non-free image was of Slimmy Jimmy. So... Let's see. Oh, Ferris uh, says the manuscript was discovered by Joe Hanks, a publisher at Penguin Random House Children's Books in the Victoria and Albert Museum archive in 2015. Mm. Mm. But so it was discovered in a museum, but wasn't it discovered by someone who later put it in a museum? How can you discover something in a museum that didn't somehow get there? You know, that's what I would wonder. <laughs> in a moleskin, yeah, indeed, it's a notebook. Also, no wonder it wasn't published before. So violent. Well, it's not the most violent story in this book. But maybe, indeed, she decided that this was not a story for kids. But somehow, there are more stories about hunting and hunters and guns. So, eh, I don't know. Oh, it only has one gun in it, and that's not more than in other stories that she did publish. Though so it's usually not the main character who does the hunting, it's usually a human. Yeah, sorry for Jay, air gun. <laughs> Maybe he would like this one. Yeah, then definitely we did finish all of the books. And we have 20 minutes left. Do we have a nice short story? Um, um. Yeah, we don't know how how short these might be very long. Japanese fairy tales. I think that's really cool. Why cannot why can these not be downloaded? We need to find them somewhere. Look. We have it. Uh, but this does not entirely fit. Let's see if I can fix this.
Yes. How long is this story? I'm interested. Do you like uh, Japanese fairy tales? Because then our next storybook is has quickly been found. Looks nice. Good. Great. My Lord Bag of Rice. Long, long ago, there lived in Japan a brave warrior known to all as Tawara Toda, or My Lord Bag of Rice. His true name was Fujiwara Hidesato, and there is a very interesting story of how he came to change his name. One day he sallied forth in search of adventure, for he had the nature of a warrior and could not bear to be idle. So he buckled on his two swords, took his huge bow, much taller than himself, in his hand and slinging his quiver on his back started out. He had not gone far when he came to the bridge of Setano Karashi, spanning one end of the beautiful Lake Biwa. No sooner had he set foot on the bridge than he saw lying right across his path a huge serpent dragon. Its body was so big that it looked like a trunk of a large pine tree, and it took up the whole width of the bridge. One of its huge claws rested on the parapet of, of one side of the bridge, while its tail lay right against the other. The monster seemed to be asleep, and as it breathed, fire and smoke came out of his nostrils. At first, Hirasato would not help feeling alarmed at the sight of this horrible reptile lying in his path. For he must either turn back or walk right over its body. He was a brave man, however, and putting aside all fear, went forward dauntlessly. Crunch, crunch. He stepped now on the dragon's body, now between its coils, and without even one glance backward, he went on his way. He had only gone a few steps when he heard someone calling him from behind. On turning back, he was much surprised to see that the monster dragon hut had entirely disappeared and in its place was a strange-looking man who was bowing most ceremoniously to the ground. His red hair streamed over his shoulders and was surmounted by a crown in the shape of a dragon's head, and his sea-green dress was patterned with shells. Hirasato knew at once that this was no ordinary mortal, and he wondered much at the strange occurrence. Where had the dragon gone in such a short space of time? Or had it transformed itself into this man? And what did the whole thing mean? While these thoughts passed through his mind, he had come up to the man on the bridge and now addressed him. Was it you that called me just now? Yes, it was I, answered the man. I have an earnest request to make to you. Do you think that you grant it to me? 
if it is in my power to do so, I will, answered Hirasato. But first, tell me who you are. I am the Dragon King of the Lake, and my home is in these waters, just under this bridge. And what is it that you have to ask of me? said Hirasato. I want you to kill my mortal enemy, the centipede, who lives on the mountain beyond. And the dragon king pointed to a high peak on the opposite shore of the lake. I have lived now for many years in this lake and I have a large family of children and grandchildren. For some time past we have lived in terror for a monster centipede has discovered our home and night after night it comes and carries off one of my family. I am powerless to see save them. If it goes on much longer like this, not only shall I lose all my children, but I myself must fall a victim to the monster. I am therefore very unhappy, and in my extremity I determined to ask the help of a human being. For many days with this intention I have waited on the bridge in the shape of the horrible ser serpent dragon that you saw, in the hope that some strong brave men would come along. But all who came this way, as soon as they saw me, were terrified and ran away as fast as they could. You are the first man I have found able to look at me without fear. So I knew at once that you were a man of great courage. I beg you to have pity upon me. Will you not help me and kill my enemy, the centipede? Hirasato felt very sorry for the Dragon King on hearing his story and readily promised to do whatever he could to help him. The warrior asked where the centipede lived so that he might attack the creature at once. The dragon queen replied that its home was on the mountain Mikami, but that it came every night at a certain hour to the palace of the lake. It would be better to wait till then. So Hirasato was con conducted to the palace of the dragon king under the bridge. Strange to say, as he followed his host downward the water, downwards, the waters parted to let them pass, and his clothes did not even feel damp as he passed through the flood. Never had Hirasato seen anything so beautiful as this palace burn, built on white marble beneath the lake. He had often heard of the sea king's palace at the bottom of the sea where all the servants and retainers were salt water fishes. But here was a magnificent building in the heart of Lake Biwa. The dainty goldfishes, red carp and silvery trout waited upon the dragon king and his guest. Hirasato was astonished at the feast that was spread for him. The dishes were crystallized lotus leaves and flowers, and the chopsticks were of the rarest ebony. As soon as they sat down, the sliding doors opened and ten lovely goldfish dancers came out, and behind them followed ten red carp musicians with Koto and the Samisen. Thus the hours flew by till midnight, and the beautiful music and dancing had banished all thoughts of the centipede. The dragon king was about to pledge the warrior in a fresh cup of wine, when the palace was suddenly shaken by a tramp, tramp, as if a mighty army had begun to march not far away. Hirasato and his host both rose to their feet and rushed to the balcony and the warrior saw on the opposite mountain 
two great balls of glowing fire coming nearer and nearer. The Dragon King stood by the warrior's side, trembling with fear. The centipede! The centipede! Those two balls are fire! A oh, fire are his eyes! It is coming for its prey! Now is the time to kill it! Hirasato looked where, he, where his host pointed and, in the dim light of the starlit evening, behind two balls of fire, he saw the long body of an enormous centipede winding round the mountains and the, right, and the light in its hundred feet glowed like so many distant lanterns moving slowly towards the shore. Hirasato show, showed not the least sign of fear. He tried to calm the Dragon King. Don't be afraid. I shall surely kill the, the centipede. Just bring me my bow and arrows. The Dragon King did as he was bid, and the warrior noticed that he had only three arrows left in his quiver. He took the bow, and fitting an arrow on the, to the notch, took careful aim and let fly. The arrow hit the centipede right in the middle of its head, but instead of penetrating, it glanced off harmless and fell to the ground. Nothing daunted, Hirasato took another arrow, fitted it to the notch of the bow and let fly. Again, the arrow hit the mark. It struck the centipede right in the middle of its head, only to glance off and fall to the ground. The centipede was invulnerable to weapons. When the Dragon King saw that even this brave warrior's arrows were powerless to kill the centipede, he lost heart and began to tremble with fear. The warrior saw that he had no, now only one arrow left in his quiver, and if this one failed, he could not kill the centipede. He looked across the waters. The huge reptile wound its horrid body seven times round the mountain and would soon come down to the lake. Nearer and nearer gleamed fireballs of eyes, and the light of its hundred feet began to throw reflections in the still waters of the lake. Then suddenly the warrior remembered that he had heard that human saliva was deadly to centipedes. But this was no ordinary centipede. This was so monstrous that even to think of such a creature made one creep with horror. Hirasato determined to try his last chance. So taking his last arrow and fist putting and first putting the end of it in his mouth, he fitted the notch to his bow, took careful aim once more, and let fly. This time, the arrow again hit the centipede right in the middle of its head. But instead of glancing off harmlessly as before, it struck home to the creature's brain. Then with a convulsive shudder, the serpentine's body stopped moving, and the fiery light of its great eyes and hundred feet darkened to a dull glare like the sunset of a stormy day, and then went out in blackness. A great darkness now overspread the heavens. The thunder rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the wind roared in a fury and it seemed as if the world were coming to an end. The Dragon King and his children and retainers all crouched in different parts of the palace, frightened to death, for the building was shaken to its foundation. At last, 
The dreadful night was over. Day dawned beautiful and clear. The centipede was gone from the mountain. Then Hidesato called to the dragon king to come out with him on the balcony, for the centipede was dead and he had nothing more to fear. Then all the inhabitants of the palace came out with joy and Hidesato pointed to the lake. There lay the body of the dead centipede floating on the water, which was dyed red with its blood. The gratitude of the Dragon King knew no bounds. The whole family came and bowed down before the warrior, calling him their preserver and the bravest warrior in all Japan. Another feast was prepared, more sumptuous than the first. All kinds of fish prepared in every imaginable way, raw, stewed, boiled and roasted, served on coral trays and crystal dishes were put before him and the wine was the best that Hirasato had ever tasted in his life. To add to the beauty of everything, the sun shone brightly, the lake glittered like a liquid diamond and the palace was a thousand times more beautiful by day than by night. His host tried to persuade the warrior to stay a few days, but Hidasato insisted on going home, saying that he had now finished what he had come to do and must return. The Dragon King and his family were all very sorry to have him leave so soon, but since he would go, they begged him to accept a few small presents, so they said, in token of their gratitude to him for delivering them forever from their horrible enemy, the centipede. As the warrior stood in the porch taking leave, the train of fish was suddenly transformed into a retinue of men, all wearing ceremonial robes and dragon crowns on their heads to show that they were servants of the great dragon king. The presents that they carried were as follows. First, a large bronze bell. Second, a bag of rice. Third, a roll of silk. Fourth, a cooking pot. Fifth, a bell. Hirasato did not want to accept all these presents, but as the Dragon King insisted, he could not well refuse. The Dragon King himself accompanied the warrior as far as the bridge and then took leave of him with many bows and good wishes, leaving the procession of servants to accompany Hidesato to his house with presents. The warrior's household and servants had been very much concerned when they found that he did not return the night before, but they finally concluded that he had been kept by the violent storm and had taken shelter somewhere. When the servants on the watch for his return caught sight of him, they called to everyone that he was approaching and the whole household turned out to meet him, wondering much what the retinue of men bearing presents and banners that followed him could mean. As soon as the Dragon King's retainers had put down the presents they had put down the presents, they vanished. And Hidasato told all that had happened told all that had happened to him. The presents which he had received from the grateful Dragon King were found to be of magic power. The bell the bell only was ordinary and as Hidesato had no use for it, he presented it to the temple nearby, where it was hung up to boom out the hour of day over the surrounding neighborhood. The single bag of rice, however much, however much was taken from it, day after day for the meal of the night and his whole family, never grew less. The supply in the bag 
was inexhaustible. The roll of silk, too, never grew shorter, though time after time long pieces were cut off to make the warrior a new suit of clothes to go to court in at the new year. The cooking pot was wonderful, too. No matter what was put into it, it cooked deliciously, whatever was wanted, without any firing. Truly a very economical saucepan. The fame of Hidesato's fortune spread far and wide, and as there was no need for him to spend money on rice, rice or silk or firing, he became very rich and prosperous, and was henceforth known as my lord bag of rice. Let's really nice and also right in time for the end of the stream economical saucepan how old is this story i don't know it doesn't say but it's older than 75 years that's for sure or else it would not be in the public domain let's see Oh, this is also, the book was published in Tokyo in 1908. So around the time of uh, Beatrix Potter. And it's supposed to have pictures as well, but this version does not have pictures. Mm. <laughs> Phoenicia says, I wish I had that roll of silk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be great, right? You'd also... If, if you'd never had to spend money on, uh, uh, on... On fabrics again, you'd also probably be very rich. Yeah. I will have to look up if I can find a version that does have pictures. But... I know that the Gutenberg.org has a lot of uh, these um, public domain stories, but none of them have any pictures. So, yeah, I, it's a good website, but there are uh, perhaps also places that do have the complete version. Or maybe I should download it. If I have the... This is plain text. More files. I don't know. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll look into that. So yeah. Uh. Yeah. I guess uh, we have stories to tell next time, and for this time the stories are done. So uh, I thank you very much. I did not have a chance to look for someone to raid. And I do not know how to do this in OBS. So um, I'll also let that be something that I'll learn next time. So uh, indeed, see you on Sunday. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Bye.